got a bunch of chairs up in the front, you guys, if you want to take that. <laughs> Be brave. Don't be shy, you guys. We have prizes. Who gets the armrest? Oh. Yeah, I want that price. <laughs> Thanks for you, man. All right. Hello and welcome to tonight's meeting of the Hand Eye Supply Curiosity Club. We're your hosts this evening. I'm Tobias Berlinger, and uh, Will is watching the door, so he'll be he'll be out and about. Um, together, we have a number of curious and exciting topics to share with you. Our series highlights an eclectic group of speakers, experiences, and workshops across a broad range of subjects in the areas of culture, design, science, technology, art, fabrication techniques, and lost common knowledge. As attendees of the Hand Eye Supply Curiosity Club, you are now all members, provided you adhere to our philosophy. Ex curiositas scientia. We pledge to learn without prejudice in pursuit of our mutual goal of perpetual novice. We admit that it is impossible to know everything about anything, and thus we remain perpetually curious and perpetually novice. And I just realized I've committed an act of blasphemy by forgetting to put our flag up. So I'm gonna just tell you about the flag and I'll grab it and put it up later. So just imagine our logo here. This is our flag and our mascot. <laughs> the lightning bolt represents the receipt of knowledge, the enlightenment of illumination, the resonance of truths understood. It awakens us and excites us and makes us hungry for more. Before we begin today, we have a special announcement from Curiosity Club alumni Katie Megan of M Space and Keegan and Megan. You'll remember her from her excellent presentation on letterpress printing. Who? Hey. I'll keep this short. Thanks, you guys, for letting me steal the floor no for a little bit. Um, I just wanted to let everyone know that Keegan Megan is um, in the last three days of a fundraiser project that we're doing through the online <coughs> fundraising. <coughs> Uh, forum Kickstarter. Um, we are trying to raise funds to save a 1950s cylinder uh, Chandler and Price printing press that is one of 350 that were ever made, or about 350, and very few left. Um, it's a press that's located in the Dallas, Oregon, in the basement of a uh, deceased printer's home his family who are not printers, um, would really love to get this out, but nobody knows quite exactly how he got it down. So the actual rigging costs of getting it out are um, pretty expensive and a lot of printers in the community have gone out and just like dreamed about trying to get this press out somewhere that people can actually operate it, not kind of tucked away. And so we're gonna take it into our studio if we raise... Turn the volume. <laughs> if we can raise these funds. Um, we've already raised over $5,000 and um, we need about just under 500 more to get, um, to get the Kickstarter. So all these people have pledged that they're gonna pay this to, the, um, to help us with this, this cost and then the, anything that's over or above is gonna go to continuing to rehab it, even though it's in great condition because this guy babied his press. So, um, kickstarter.com, you just type in Keegan Megan, it's K-E-E-G-A-N-N-E-E-G-A-N. -E 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 and there's a little video animation that we did, so, you, or, sort of, yeah. Uh, do you know Curtis Knapp of uh, YU? I don't. It would be good to get in touch with him. They have a printing and uh, press area within the new YU space. Oh, cool. They would Yeah, <laughs> right now we're probably gonna use our, we're, we're hoping to, to get it out safely with a rigging company that we've worked with. Actually, I think Ken and Joe have also worked with this rigging company that is familiar with presses and the needs of them. So at this point, we feel like we've exhausted those options and we feel like that's to, to, to hold on to it. But you never know, we'll see. Is it gonna be at your space or at M's space? Um, it's going to be uh, in town storage in the, Ke in, in the Keegan Megan studio. So, um, and there's some really cool prizes, you know, if you donate some cool button packs and art prints. So, please take a look. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Give you guys some more. Right. Thanks, Katie. And now I'd like to introduce Joe Mansfield and Ken Samita of Grove. Founded in 2009, Grove is a team of designers and makers in Portland, Oregon, focused on changing the way you think about products. 
thing uh, less lecture like you know, I don't like lectures they're boring so we want to make it more interactive so we're going to stop frequently instead of doing a Q&A at the end we're going to stop frequently and, and talk about things whatever thoughts you guys have questions or you know, we're not experts I don't think anyone's an expert if we can just discuss it'll be more interesting so um, any questions <laughs> oh, not yet, not yet. okay uh, I guess I can start um, We'll start with talking about our education or lack of one. Um, both of us um, were not like, formally trained as designers. Um, I went to school for graduate school for architecture briefly, but I, I quit because I was frustrated by talking about design so much. I wanted to actually do it, make one. So uh, I started uh, working in custom furniture fabrication and bamboo sculptures. And I think I started Tomita Designs like maybe four years ago, and that's partly how Joe and I met, but um, I did custom furniture and fabrication for about four years till about uh, a year ago, when growth got too crazy. Yeah, and so I, I started out um, with a degree in multimedia design at University of Oregon, so it's not really related to product design, um, but it is sort of like a brief overview of many different design uh, practices. And uh, I started a laser engraving company uh, about five years ago. I just had an idea in my head and I couldn't, couldn't sleep for a month. So I just went ahead and bought a laser and started um, engraving artwork onto all kinds of materials. And eventually um, realized that I, I enjoyed curating artist series. So just a uh, all this artwork that I was looking at every day online, I, I would just get in touch with the artists and invite them to be part of my series and give them royalties when their products sold. And so, um, yeah, Ken, Ken and I um, met, I was actually a across the street from his wood shop. Um, this yeah. was probably yeah, just, four years ago. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we, we were both, um, just um, we, we would throw the football around in the street and just like geek out about design instead of working. It's just uh, <laughs> and we that's a story. <laughs> right yeah, yeah. Uh, we're, we're we're nerds. You know? yeah. we, we love talking about <laughs> creating. So we we get you know I go over to Joe's house, which is across the street, and we just talk about like ideas. And Joe's always like, check out this blog I saw, and this, these cool things, and we want to do this and that, and we're just always dream, dreaming up stuff. But um, I guess that's the early beginnings of Grove. Um, Joe had an idea for making a bamboo iPhone case for a long time, uh, years probably. Yeah. And it, it never really occurred to me to participate in that. We, I was doing my own thing. We were just friends. Yeah, I'm, we're not really sure how it happened. Yeah, but we should probably make something <laughs> up because people ask us sometimes. Yeah. But there's like a from that to this. I don't know what happened. It just. I think it was the happened. football that connected. Yeah, yeah it, it was. You, know, you throw that thing around, and it's it's kind of like um, it used to be baseball, though, right? You play catch with your dad, or whatever. Yeah, and you just throw ideas back and forth. Yeah, um, yeah. I, in my search for a, a local CNC um, manufacturer, um, I, I had really tough luck. Um, all the shops either thought it was an impossible project because the tolerances are ludicrous. Um, or, or that it, it'd be $100 a piece, you know, which basically um, is not a, a, a business. Um, so I'm not sure but how this happened, but Ken just bought a CNC mill. Um, <laughs> 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 just freaking went yeah. for it. Yeah. <laughs> he was like, hmm, life saving? Should I get a condo or a CNC mill? So um, I, think, I think a mill is a little more fun than a condo. Um, yeah, <laughs> no, that, one, that one worked out. The timing is perfect, you know. Yeah. So um, we just uh, to finish off the the history of, of Grove, um, we we basically um, spent eight months um, developing our first prototype, um, our first product, which was an iPhone case for the the 3G, 
And the day we launched it, um, Gizmodo leaked the iPhone 4. <laughs> so, so this is a total colossal flop. flop. I mean, it's, it's like the worst luck ever, right? Because uh, when people start thinking about the next product, nobody will buy accessories for the previous one. So you know, if you make iPhone accessories, you have a, a short um, product life. But it, it got compacted because of this leak, which is which which is unprecedented. If you guys follow that kind of stuff, yeah. So, I mean, it's funny now, but it was. That's, that's, uh, yeah. So we just wrote this <laughs> off as a, a training exercise, yeah, really. That's all it was. <laughs> Eight months of training. <laughs> but, um, so. Do so you guys have any questions at this point? Is the tooling harder for that one because there's more curves? Yeah, much yeah so that's the interesting thing. Is this the practice was way more, way more difficult than the on the four. So the four came to like a few cases or anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. By the time we designed this thing. When you say really hard tolerances, what kind of tolerance are you talking about? So our case uh, relies on a friction fit. Um, there's a fabric on the inside that compresses, and so it has to fit just right. Otherwise, the pieces won't hold together. Specifically, um, I, I make changes to the machine of like two thousandths of an inch, and you can tell the difference. Um, so one of our hairs is three thousandths. So, yeah. <laughs> and, and also, uh, I have this obsession with making things the best it can be. So I was trying to make it as thin as humanly possible out of natural material. So if you look at like uh, cheaper knockoffs and stuff, uh, most normal people design to make things easy to make, so they end up much bigger, especially in natural materials, so. Mm -hmm. You said your um, development system, which um, is really a lot tighter because of the leak. So what do you plan for? Because you're planning for future iPhone products and iPad. And so what do you generally plan for in the life cycle for like, how do you manage, how many are you gonna create? Um, well, the, usually the life cycle is around a year um, for, for the products. And we, should iPhone. and we started growth when that came out, which is a bad idea. If anybody wants to do something where you're piggybacking on somebody else's product, you don't want to launch at the end of the product cycle. It's like suicide, business suicide. So, uh, but you know, you have to learn somehow. Growing pains, some part of that. Could it be a good idea that if you're within the system of, say, the company that's launching the, the product, that you're with them in some way or form? That you know ahead of time what you're uh, gonna yeah. yeah, see, Apple's really secretive. Uh, they make everyone sign NDAs, I'm sure. Um, and you know, Chinese factories are notorious for leaks, so a little information leaks out, you know. So yeah. we're always like looking online and trying to anticipate what the next one is. Yeah, and we actually made um, a prototype of the iPhone 4 before it was released based on the specs, the leak specs, and that was a giant advantage for us yeah. because. Um, we had our prototype photographed and ready to just Photoshop in the controls. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so it was a, you know, we turned a negative into a positive. Right. The, the, the leak killed this, but then we, we knew what the next one's gonna look like months ahead. Yeah. Yeah, so you never know. What strategies have you considered for marketing? What did you eventually do? Was it successful? Did it change? Uh, well, originally, you know, when we formed our business plan, it, Grove is basically an extension of what Joe and I have been doing for the last four years with our own businesses. And uh, what kind of brought us together, besides football, was we have these like big ideals, you know, that you, you do good work, you treat people right, and you make a really good product, people will talk about it, and things kind of take care of themselves. And that's always worked for me with my business, and it's worked really well for Joe. And that was our plan with Grove, and it, and it, and it, and it worked. Um, we don't really do that much active marketing, but we rely on word of mouth, especially with blogs, but with individual people too. If, if you look at our analytics for our website, it's a ton of them are direct hits, meaning it's somebody showing their product to their friend, like, hey, check this out, you know, and yeah. they type it in. So, so yeah, to answer your question, we, we don't have a marketing budget, and uh, we just rely on uh, word of mouth and, and so blogs. So you're totally selling off your website, mm -hmm. not like yeah. contributors. No, no. And that's part of it, yeah. We'll get to that. Yeah. All right, so part two uh, is uh, we're going to talk about local manufacturing, the advantages of local manufacturing versus probably specifically China. Yeah. Uh, so one of the big advantages is uh, 
not having to deal with the headache of importing, um, not, not just the headache of it, but um, the shipping costs of, of importing product from other countries can really start to add up. Uh, that comes into play in quantity, especially. Like, uh, let's say you get these widgets made in China and they're really cheap, but um, you have to get a certain quantity before the, the shipping cost uh, pays for itself, makes it worthwhile. So you're stuck dealing with uh, larger quantities, which means more risk. And also less flexibility. Um, most Chinese factories have uh, pretty large minimums, um, five to 10,000 units typically. Um, and I mean, that's pretty small, small beans for them. So, so for guys like us that are uh, not self financed, it's, it's tough, you know, to have that kind of upfront capital too. And the other big advantage of um, making things locally is. Um, the time it takes to go from an idea to a finished product. Um, you can go from one prototype to the next um, in days instead of weeks. You don't have to you know, be on a plane to China or you know, be waiting for FedEx to get you your revised sample. Back and forth, it, mm -hmm. it takes a while. And in our industry, um, timing is everything. And so um, speed, it, we're, we're just all about speed. Uh, another advantage of doing something locally is you can monitor the quality in person much easier. You, could, you can go, to, you can uh, drive there and check out the factory, make sure people are getting treated right, make sure you, you like the factory uh, managers, you can uh, do, inspect it yourself and uh, communicate the standards, what's important to you, which is much more difficult if it's um, overseas. Yeah. Um, Speaking of um, samples from China, um, I have an uncle who um, designs backpacks and he's had a business called Overland Equipment for, for decades. Um, he produced his, his backpacks in Chico, California for two decades before giving in to the pressure to outsource things. Well, he actually sold his business because as soon as he released an innovative design, a Chinese factory would rip it off and then he'd move on to the next thing. He'd get ripped off right away. And in the soft goods industry, it's um, pretty cutthroat. Um, and he, he's pretty jaded about um, the whole industry and suggested that I get samples from China. Um, but we, we didn't actually end up doing that, so. <laughs> <laughs> Just a side note. <laughs> and of course, uh, you know, jobs especially a city like Portland. Uh, Did anybody rip you off yet? <laughs> uh, kind of, not, not directly. Um, it's, it's interesting. Uh, the way we design, uh, we design for, to make the best thing possible. And sometimes we do a lot of things that don't make any sense <laughs> at a production level. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, unintended side effect of that is uh, we haven't been directly copied. Uh, like on our icon design, have this, this uh, black uh, bezel. It's like a separate piece that's laser cut and then glued in. And it's a really cumbersome process. So all the bamboo cases made in China, they're just one piece of bamboo and that's carved out. You don't have this separate assembly process. Yeah, they look at this and they just think we're insane. Like, what are those guys thinking? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, even Apple will build um, where two materials come together. They'll build, like, a, uh, it'll either reveal or, like, a what do you call it? A crumb, crumb gutter. <laughs> where, where two um, things yeah. come together so the polish is not too perfect. And uh, like with this particular design, there's, for better or for worse, we made it so it's, a, it's this perfect seam and it's really difficult to do. So unintended, but I think it's kept us from getting uh, knocked off. Um, some of our uh, legitimate competitors have been uh, knocked off. So it's something uh, I don't really worry about it too much. Everybody always asks that. Like, we have patents, and you know, I got better things to worry about. Than Doesn't your artist series, like, add, I mean, you have artists that you work with, so that kind of makes it also really unique? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's it's pretty hard. difficult to copy, yeah. yeah. So that seems like a good pairing, too. Yeah, definitely. And your life cycle's so short that by the time yeah. you get the patent, it's going yeah. to be 18 months later. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's kind of fun. It's so expensive and stuff. It's just like, where do you want to put your energy, you know? If, if we worry about, we don't really need to worry about other people. 
focused on what we do, it was just fine. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, another issue with um, outsourcing things that you don't have to worry about when making things locally is the whole um, language barrier and you know the communication difficulties um, when dealing with a, a factory overseas. Um, it can lead to disasters. You know, if if your tolerances are off, if they think you're you're saying a tenth of an inch instead of a thousandth, you know, then your product's not going to work. And uh, I haven't done it personally, but I've heard from uh, uh, my friends and whatnot that it, it can be done, uh, but they often recommend that you know somebody you can trust over there that can lead you around and be a liaison. Yeah. Like a man. So it's, uh, it's, it's, I guess it's pretty risky to just jump into Alibaba.com and pick someone out of the blue and hand over $50,000 or whatever. So. Right. I mean, the other risk with that is... Um, them stealing your design and making it on the side. Um, Chinese factories um, don't have much respect for intellectual property. And, you know, we've had lots of factories rip off um, our designs and they'll actually um, copy our photos directly from the website and put it on Alibaba. But they don't make the case because it's too hard. They make some up. <laughs> but they use the pictures, yeah. <laughs> So um, we'll talk about disadvantages of making locally. Um, a big one is uh, the infrastructure. You know, uh, manufacturing's gone overseas a lot, so there's there's not that many companies locally that, that can fabricate, and there are some. Uh, but uh, I think there could be problems with scalability if if you had something really take off. Um, you know, Foxconn's not going to be built overnight in Hillsboro, so. Um, also, cost is the big one, right? Um, as we gain experience with this business, I mean, I've really started to understand why things are made in China. And a big reason is just it's cheaper. You know, that's why businesses make a lot of decisions, right? It's just the bottom line. Um, yeah, but things are gradually shifting. The wages in China have been going up. Um, I read 15% a year recently, so um, it's becoming less and less competitive with Western wages. So overall, maybe the difference isn't as staggering as before. The, since Chinese wages are going up and shipping costs are going up, the difference between making something overseas and here used to be a huge cut price difference, and it's a little bit less now. So it's something that, you know, if you weigh in the, the headaches and then uh, the shipping costs and whatnot, it's something I think a lot of companies should consider uh, for quality, uh, et cetera. Can you talk about the realities of the outsourcing of bamboo for pricing? Of uh, pricing over there? Yeah. How do you, where do you source your bamboo from? Yeah, we have a couple of distributors that we source our material from. Um, there's maybe three big companies that do it. Um, they're all made in China, the panels. There's a few companies working on it here in America. It's going to be a long time. The interesting thing is the bottleneck is the raw material. Uh, timber grade bamboo is not grown in an industrial quantity in America. So. Yeah, and it needs the right climate. Um, our friends at Bamboo Revolution are actually, um, they have plans to um, grow bamboo in Louisiana. Um, so apparently but that's the right climate. For it. I think it, it'll happen. It's just going to take a while where it can be domestically produced. Yeah, maybe 10 years out. I mean, we'd love to buy bamboo locally. So uh, as far as the disadvantage, the big one is cost, right? And, and when we start seeing, whoa, like, like for example us, there's no way we can wholesale. We're direct only, absolutely direct only. We get asked all the time and that's it. And, and it's, it's not even really a decision. Like we can't sell at wholesale rates. We, it's something we don't think about normal people. You know, when you go to the store, that thing's been marked up 50% because the store has to make money. They have infrastructure and marketing and, rent and whatever. But and with, with the right product, you can maybe afford to wholesale right, when yeah. you make it locally. If, if it's, it's easy enough to make. Yeah. yeah, it doesn't require as much labor as yeah. um, our product does. So, so kind of the loophole is if you can go direct, you can beat the system. You can defeat this cost disadvantage. Um, and, and right now we live in kind of an exciting era where you can do that. The cost of distribution is low. The internet's free. People talk about your stuff, they're 
we have like all these salesmen out there for free um, hawking our stuff. So uh, right now is a great time to be an entrepreneur, I think, because of that direct sales. And you can actually make things in America and be competitive if you go direct. Yeah, that kind yeah. Of exactly. I mean, it's the only way we can make it work as a business, you know, sustainable business. But, um, I guess that's, we're going to switch to talking specifically about um, making everything yourselves locally instead of just making things locally um, by subcontracting out. Um, any questions before we move into that? I have a question. Yeah. You know, we, we actually have a whole line of um, artwork that isn't tied to any Apple product. Um, it's laser engraved into bamboo yeah, and... Real. Oh, yeah. There you go. The real interesting thing about it is it's um, not tied to um, a rectangle. Um, we actually cut out the... It's just the packaging. We actually cut out um, the piece as well. So it's all about the silhouette. And that's something fun that the artist can design for. Well, what's the catchphrase for yourself in the rectangle? Yeah. Break, break away from the rectangle. Yeah, like that. <laughs> but yeah, that brings me a good point. You know, I think um, if you're piggybacking on a product that's lasting a year, it's, it's, it's really hard. Every year, it's like, of development again, again, again. And it's, um, it's a really volatile business model. It's super risky and not really sustainable long term. So um, we hope to grow our brand strong enough where we don't have to be attached to something and I, th I think we're on the right track. Yeah, but as, as far as like um, making something that will become obsolete, um, I guess um, people are going to buy a case for their iPhone anyways. If, if they're, I mean, a lot of people don't like cases on their phones, but if they're going to buy one, um, we provide an option that's a natural material, that's biodegradable, that's locally made, instead of, you know, it's synthetic material that's, that's not going to you know, degrade over time. So. And also, I mean, you can hang it on your wall. It's artwork. <laughs> <laughs> when you're done with it. <laughs> I mean, but they're like beautifully laser engraved. Like they, they are beautiful in and of themselves, for sure. So yeah, I mean, that's like, it's like a really serious, I mean, that's a lot, really a viable option for it. Hold yeah. on to it after. And, you know, it might be that the products change, but people will try to keep We actually had a customer who bought one of these, and uh, it was like the ultimate compliment. He said uh, he puts it up on his desk as inspiration. He doesn't even put his phone in it, and he, he's a designer as well. So it's like, well, that's it could be an opportunity for you too to refurbish the old ones into art once you know once the 3G or 4G phone is dead. You know, send it back for 15 bucks. We'll mount it for you or something. Yeah. So the next segment, um, you know, taking this locally made thing to the next level, I think is, uh, we call it Grove Made, but it's uh, basically doing everything yourself. Yeah, that means uh, we do all the photography, all the web design, um, all the back-end development for order processing system. Um, product design, package design, package construction, uh, craftsmanship, CNC work, laser work. We don't make our business cards, however. <laughs> <laughs> and we don't grow the bamboo. I, you know, I, I'm pretty comfortable saying we're at 99%. We can't do everything, everything, but pretty close. Um, 
How big is your staff? Uh, we have 15 employees. Um, so some of the advantages of <laughs> some of the biggest advantages of doing everything yourself um, are flexibility um, and speed. Um, in our industry, um, having having a product the next day is imperative, and by not having to wait for a subcontractor to get us, you know, a sample of something back, um, we we can have our product out you know, in, in a few weeks instead of several months. Yeah, I would go as far as saying we're blazing fast. Like we can't be faster. You know, our, and part of the, uh, our decision-making process is, is not cumbersome. We don't have meetings, we don't have flights, we don't have negotiations. We just start making stuff right away and just get to it. Yeah, the transition so, between prototype and finished product is not clear. It's a, it's a real blurry line. because. Um, <laughs> We go from a prototype and just start making it, and um, as we make it, we, we figure out things and and just improve the process gradually. And by, by we, I don't mean like me and Joe. I mean like our whole team. You know, everybody who's working uh, on production, we're tweaking things. We're finding better ways to do it, changing the design. We're doing it all simultaneously. So it's uh, kind of a difficult way to work. You know, sometimes you want to get something perfect and then start making a lot of them, but we don't have time to do that, so we just go. And uh, we couldn't do that if we didn't have our own machinery. Uh, that's like going in with the flow, you know, you have to. Otherwise, yeah. if you lack time, you fall behind. Mm -hmm. I think it's fun, it's the thrill. And then another advantage of having everything made in the, in the, under the same roof is um, there, there's lots of um, inspiration from everyone in how to um, refine the process and the product. Um, people who are making one part can apply techniques to another, you know, component of the product and vice versa. So, so do you even have production drums, or do you just go straight from a 3D model to a CNC? We don't even have a 3D model. Oh really? <laughs> <laughs> there is no 3D model of this guy. We just start cutting. We go straight to making it. It kind of reminds me of in school, like I just got criticized for not doing the drawings, not being a good drawer. I just like to, to go. And we do. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> or, you know. so. uh, and also, uh, with the flexibility and speed, we can respond to our customers. You know, we, we're always watching that. Part of our job is to just pay attention to what's going on out there, see what people are saying about cases in general, what, what they're saying about their iPhones or iPads, and we can respond to that input very quickly um, and because it's simplified. We have a small company and everything is done fast. Yeah, and instead of waiting um, to get the product revised, you know, in a factory off-site, um, we can make those changes and test it out, you know, the same day. And, uh, so, so we're constantly improving our, our product. That's a big part of our company. It's also nice for me personally, the, the fact that I don't have to depend on these other vendors too much. Uh, it's, it's kind of under our control. You don't have to wait for people. Sometimes it's, certain companies are good, so others are slow, and it's, it's, it can be very frustrating. So we've gravitated towards more and more doing everything ourselves. Uh, you know, Steve, is, you, you, Steve here has the uh, original design, had the black um, anodized aluminum bezel, which was sweet, but uh, that, we couldn't make that part. Our laser can't cut metal. And just that one thing that somebody else had to do caused this chain reaction of headaches and quality problems. Um, and they, you know, they're a good company, but they don't care as much as we do. No one's gonna care as much as we do. So um, we've gravitated towards <laughs> parts that we can make ourselves. So now it's, uh, we went to bamboo bezel and now it's uh, Birch. So. Yeah. So, if, oh, go ahead. So you've got 15 employees now. Do you want to get bigger or is this manageable? Uh, I think we're at a good. I like the size we're at. I think we have a great team. Um, you know, it's. Yeah. I 
I'd say it's a sweet spot for sure. I mean, we have a really young crew and everyone gets along super yeah, well. Still have a life. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we're, we're kind of busy at life, but. Yeah. We, it's, we, it's still fun, you know? I don't know. I like to keep it that way. Um, it's definitely big enough now that we're, you know, that's actually one of the disadvantages of doing everything yourself. You have to do payroll, you have to do accounting, you gotta, you know, having a large company means you have to run the business. Right? If, or if I was a designer sitting at home at my desk and somebody else is making it, I could have a really simplified business. So it does get more complicated. If you're so are you managing or are you actually working on the uh, physical tasks? We uh, wear many hats. Like yeah, everybody does yeah. at our company. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> huh? Many, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> I probably don't do that much of the production work, but I'm still heavily involved in uh, figuring out how to do it. You know? um, but yeah, everybody, you know, it's a, it's, it's the line between manager and worker is blurred for sure. So in your personal life, do you feel like you kind of balance between you know, you're working like 60, 70 hours a week or is it? Uh, it's gotten a lot better. When we first, when the iPhone 4 came out, we, we grew uh, extremely rapidly and we're probably working 90 hours a week. But now our team is really well established and uh, you know, Joe and I aren't as necessary as before. There are a lot of tasks that only we could do before and people have um, stepped it up. So it's much more well balanced and I feel really good about it. Go. So I'm curious, so you said it was a good time for entrepreneurs and that there's, um, I mean, there's a lot of folks like you, like you in Portland, a lot of makers, and I'm um, curious what you think of the potential for growing more of a localized manufacturing um, thing here. Like, is it, are you doing big enough production and can companies like you do big enough production to create the demand for the manufacturing side? Which Good question. Yeah, I mean, I think this city, I mean, is is ripe for a manufacturing facility, like a shared manufacturing facility. Um, there, there are a lot of ideas that are just waiting to be made. So, um, part of the issue, uh, from my personal experience, is um, a lot of the companies that have big machinery that we have, CNC machines, lasers, and stuff like that. Um, they're there's not very many companies that do other people's work. You know, they, they do their own widgets. And uh, people are really reluctant to step outside the box and do something that's kind of difficult. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of a problem with the uh, Yeah, level. and the job shops that are really good will be um, too expensive to, to have, make it so the you know, numbers pencil out and um, they'll be too busy as well. So your lead times for getting you know, prototypes back will basically kill kill your product. But, I don't know, from our experience. I think there's a void. If people want to get into the manufacturing business. It's, it's people asking me all the time. I don't have anybody doing it for me. So. Uh, okay, another main point is uh, the design-build philosophy. It kind of comes from uh, both of our backgrounds, we've always designed and built simultaneously. Like I always made my own stuff, all my furniture. I made it myself or with one helper at most. Um, and I, I always believed in that, that uh, something gets lost when the designer and maker is separated. Um, it's, it's done because of efficiency, right? We can't do it at a certain scale, but um, you know, in the old days, you go to a craftsman and they take responsibility for a project all the way through and have a personal relationship. So that's not entirely possible with growth, but we're kind of taking the, those principles. And I think we reap, we definitely reap some benefits of uh, the design build uh, philosophy. Yeah, for sure. Um, one, one real concrete example of, of how um, designing and building the product has benefited us is um, our packaging design. Um, so that's our iPhone 4 packaging. It's uh, you get it in the mail like this. It's wrapped in vellum, and uh, you can see uh, in the case is held in this frame. And uh, the story behind this frame is is a good one. Um, 
we were designing packaging back in the day. What are we going to do to package this thing? And Joe has the laser. So like, oh, let's make it. And we actually made some pretty cool um, laser cut cardboard packaging. I don't know what happened to it. It, it was nice. It was nice. But it you know, had to be pretty thick. It took a lot of time. And it's still, cardboard is recycled, but it's still a lot of material. Yeah, and it's, it's just uh, getting discarded after you open it. So uh, because we were making the things, these things are carved out of solid bamboo. So they have to be held in place. Um, so here's the actual piece. We do five at a time. And <laughs> once it's <laughs> sanded, yeah. So uh, the, ba the machine basically cuts out the inside and then there's another operation that cuts out the backside, but they're um, left in with tabs. It's a common CNC technique. You have to hold the parts in or else they fly out. So you need some kind of structure around it to, to hold it. And uh, one morning, Joe and I came to work with the exact same idea. Yeah. I mean, it's so obvious. Yeah, it was just staring us in the face, like, like all this, this waste material. So what, is this? what do we do with that? Yeah. This, is, this is going in this garbage, all this material. Uh, we could have made it a little thinner, maybe about that thin, you know, if we weren't making the frames, but not, not that much. Yeah. We need the structure, so. So we run a few more tool paths to clean up um, this piece after we pop the cases out, and then actually um, cut this down to size, sand and finish it, um, and it turns into like, the packaging for our product. Um, and then we also um, provide a, a matching artist print the same design that's on the back of the iPhone case, so people can then hang this on their wall or you know have it on their desk or whatnot. And a lot of people put in their own photographs, and you know, kind of the idea is to create something of more value instead of going down the chain, go up the chain. Mm -hmm. And it actually takes it takes some work, but it's um, not that much, relatively speaking. And uh, in terms of cost, it's probably a wash. You know, we don't have to make the other packaging. We don't have to buy the other materials. This is free. So it ends up being basically a wash business wise. So you know we don't really push, um, you know, saying we're eco friendly, blah blah blah. But I like to say we just do what makes sense to us. Like this just makes sense. You know, when we make when we're making it, it's it's obvious. Yeah. <laughs> so this is a great example of a designer maker blended together. You notice things that are. There's probably stuff like this going on all over the world. There's stuff that's like blatantly obvious and it's just not happening. There's a separation. Any questions? I, I don't know a whole lot about your market or industry, so this may be a dumb question, but no dumb questions here, right? Yeah, right. No. <laughs> Only dumb answers. Um, yeah. So, as far as distribution, I know that you guys are saying you're direct, but every time I go to an Apple store, I'm just wondering, like, is that something you consider? Is that something you don't care about? Is it, what does it take to get distribution in Apple stores? Would that then make your business explode to a point that's not manageable? You want to keep it small? What's that process? It's, well, it's nightmarish as I think. Yeah, it's, it's, I've heard it's pretty nightmarish. Bas basically, you have to meet Apple um, in a dark street corner <laughs> at like <laughs> nine, nine o'clock <laughs> with, you know, 10,000 units of your product and you know it's all by their terms so really? yeah but, um, we, we can't do it business wise but also um, you know we, we can't um, you know we haven't gotten to the drawbacks yet but I'll skip ahead you know if you do things yourself the drawback is you're not infinitely scalable if the demand goes up a thousand percent you can't hire 100 people overnight um, you could but your quality is going to take a nose dive um, so the lack of scalability is is something uh like we, with our model, we can't really go to those quantities. Um, we don't really want to either. Um, I can't figure too much. <laughs> what is it? just got fired from this phone. It's risen. Yeah, so our, our design of our products is partially influenced by um, the tools we use to manufacture them. So. Uh, we, we use methods that um, are easy to set up. Um, so both, both the mill and lasers are relatively quick to set up compared to 
um, tooling a die for, for casting parts. Yeah, and there's no like $20,000 um, fee for making the uh, molds, the, like the injection molding. Uh, st we just stay away from those processes. Um, and the, the methods we use are more uh, expensive in, in a mass quantity, but we own the equipment, so it's like that kind of gets around that. Um, and those processes are also quicker to set up, and mm -hmm. so you, you can be quicker to the market with a product. So. And uh, actually, um, having the equipment has other benefits too, like uh, experimentation. Part of our my vision with buying my own machine was, hey, I'm going to be able to mess around with this thing and try all these cool things that no one else has tried. You know, these machines are in the hands of big factories, typically. Um, they're not in the hands of artists, so we thought um, probably correctly you know, that if we have our own equipment, it'll give us the freedom to experiment and innovate that we wouldn't have if we had to pay someone to do it. Yeah, and it, it is usually a lot of fun to play around on the machines, except uh, today. <laughs> we have two of our machines are down. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, there's also headaches associated with having your own equipment. Yeah. You, you bootstrap it yourself. Yeah. 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 What, was the, what were the initial costs of you know, tools and setup and things like that? Um, Under fifty thousand. Uh, yeah. So we we've, we've grown really organically, yeah. like throughout the years. I mean, I, I started out in my studio apartment with a the smallest laser I could find. You know, just like two feet from my bed. <laughs> 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 you know, and it was just um, you know did what it take to. You know, just learn the learn the equipment and the processes. So. Um, but as far as buying um, the mills and larger equipment, it does require some some capital. So. And we've been going like one at a time. Um, we we grow really slowly, um, which is a strength or weakness depending on how you look at it. Um, I think uh, if you're doing things your help yourself, you you have to go slowly um, if, you, if you don't want to compromise uh, quality. Yeah, we don't want um, investors, you know, telling us what to do, and so we we keep it entirely self-funded. And um, I would recommend that. I don't, <laughs> so. I don't know if that you had a defined beginning point, but from if there was, how long did it take you to be in the lab? Well, we don't really have a defined. It, everything is just kind of blending together. Yeah, you know, um, probably you know iPhone three was a flop, and the four iPhone four was successful. You know, so um. a hundred years. <laughs> but it's kind of an extension of our personal, the way we live. Too, it's kind of conservative and. Like, Slow, you know. We don't like. It may always seem kind of aggressive, but you know, a lot of businesses start out with all this venture capital or like borrow a ton of money, and go bang, you know. We kind of take it easy and grow as we feel comfortable. Kind of like In and Out Burger. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Biggest fan in the world right here. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, a big, a huge benefit of doing things ourselves is the quality. I think, you know, good factories have high quality. The highest, fa highest quality is going to be if you do it yourself or your own small team. Uh, yeah, our team's actually motivated by the feedback um, we get from our Facebook fans, our Twitter followers. Um, we have we have a lot of two-way conversations going on with our customers. There's a real direct relationship that we have, and so. Um, that really um, improves the quality and and just it makes doing business fun. Yeah, like if you go to Best Buy and buy something, there's middlemen in between you and the maker, as consumer and maker, and there's very little. There's the internet in between us and the consumer. So, just bringing that relationship closer, I think, makes our product better. There's like an accountability um, from the worker's perspective. You're going to care more because talking to the people you just sold the stuff to. So. Yeah, and quality control is done at all stages um, of the manufacturing process because 
everyone cares about the product. Um, whereas if you just had an anonymous factory making you parts, um, you, you never know unless you have have someone stationed at that factory like doing quality control, overseeing things. So. And believe it or not, um, most of our employees are more strict than Joe and I, for yeah. sure. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, that's amazing how much uh, they care about the quality and they're implementing their own systems and checking. And uh, that self-driven motivation, I think, um, is probably uh, more prevalent in a closer-knit, direct relationship where you're making it yourself and selling it to somebody. Uh, let's see, another thing um, that's special about Grove in particular, um, in terms of a factory setting, you know, basically you have a mini factory and uh, you, factory managers drive for efficiency, right? You want things to be efficient. And uh, you know, basic principles of specialization, doing the same thing. You know? So the extreme case would be uh, somebody who does the same task all day. Carpal tunnel. All day, the same thing, and then they get really good at it, you know. Um, but we kind of believe in like a bigger way of thinking, that you know, happy people is, are going to make better things. It's really simple, you know. So we try to spread the tasks out, um, everyone's involved, and uh, there's so many decisions out that have to be made, when because these are um, made of natural material. Somebody's making decisions every time, like, how much do I need to sand this, or do I need to stop here? I'm checking through these flaws that I think uh, morale leads to higher quality. So that's something we factor in mm -hmm. maybe way a lot more than like specialization and faster, 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 faster. Well, and also having uh, more people involved, it's it's you you can uh, troubleshoot things as a group and you know figure out how to refine um, every step in the process. Like uh, the CNC in particular is really difficult, um, and there's sometimes we make trying to make some crazy little part or something, and no one could figure it out. Like no one person could figure it out. It takes five people, all their ideas, 90% of them don't work. You take the top 10% from each person, add it up, and you <laughs> might get it. Yeah, it's a real collective effort. So. Um, so we already touched on some of the disadvantages, the lack of scalability, um, cost is higher than outsourcing, um, you know, growth has to be slow and organic, it can't, you can't just, you know, follow your demand perfectly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you're using a huge factory, they would be able to run on a swing shift and a night shift, and plenty of room to, and it just doesn't work that way with us. We're, we're limited, we can't, we simply can't produce uh, more than we're comfortable with. Yeah. Um, there's also a steep learning curve with learning how, how or with uh, teaching yourself how to um, yeah. use the equipment. And right. Setting it up, you know, getting the infrastructure built, you know, making a factory is a lot of work versus using an existing one that's already working. It's right. not something to be underestimated. Uh, but the part. upside is it's a just really fun learning experience, like right. working through all those brick walls. Uh, difficulties with equipment, they're breaking down all the time. Um, it's not somebody else's problem, it's our problem. And a big one that um, people should think about before they jump in like we did is uh, long-term commitment. If you're using uh, factories, you can, it doesn't work out, you can stop using them and move on with your regular life, but uh, there's kind of a long-term commitment when you, when you buy all the stuff and build all the infrastructure. You, you know, I call it go hard or go home. You have to come in, yeah. or not. Yeah. Did you say go hard or go home? Go hard or go home. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's the that's the only way to do it if you're gonna do it this way. Yeah. There's no turning back. So. So for us, um, making everything ourselves is definitely worth it. Um, it's not for everyone, but we feel that the benefits, you know, definitely outweigh the costs of, of doing it. Um, there's just a, a human element of, of, of doing everything ourselves and just all the relationships we've, we've built um, with our crew. Um, and there's like an intangible value besides our product going to our customers added by um, internally. You know, like Joe and I are, are really inspired by being involved in this and hopefully uh, our team members are. Um, 
just uh, having jobs and being happy to go to work and working on cool projects. It's an uh, intangible benefit, I think, that makes it all worth it. Yeah, and we're just having having fun doing it. And yeah. yeah. I'm sure you've seen some slides of fun stuff. You know, it's uh, I think that's a big, you think kind of big picture, you know. If you're having fun and it's, you're happy doing it, good things are going to happen. So. Are you sticking with bamboo? Are you planning any different? Uh, we're not like married to bamboo. Uh, I've been using it for a long time. I definitely like the material. Uh, but, you know, we're, we're capable of using anything, even metal. Um, our newest product, we actually uh, use the material Joe's really experienced here. Yeah, so our new iPad 2 case um, actually has a leather cover. Um, it's a domestic vegetable tan leather. Um, so it, it engraves really nicely. I should have engraved this, but um, it also uh, wears really nice over time. And uh, unlike a lot of um, highly processed leathers, which most people are familiar with, this um, darkens and develops a patina with use. And you know, if if you grab grab the cover here, it's gonna you know darken where you're touching it. Um, so. And your design has the uh, leather on the outside rather than the microfiber on the Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Is that a rapid response against you being responsible for smart covers? Uh huh. Exactly. Yeah, we yeah. we were just reading forums and we we saw that uh, a lot of iPad two customers were complaining about the Apple cover because it folds outwards. And so that when you put it on a table, the ultra suede collects dust, um, crumbs, whatever you may be setting it on. And so um, as I was prototyping this, I, I quickly um, started mocking up versions that fold out like that. So it's just um, leather on the outside. And that if they wanted to react to it, it would take months, right? Yeah. Or it takes yeah. us hours. Um, uh, this, it's kind of funny. Um, you see how this one's sewn. We went out and bought an industrial sewing machine, not knowing how to sew, and Joe sewed this. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's part, part of our ethos. Is like I almost out. lost my eye, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. the, the needle snapped. It hit me in the lip. <laughs> Close call. Your laser cutter can um, pull off those You know, we actually um, are die cutting the leather currently, and we're we're considering possibly die cutting ourselves. So uh, this one's laser cut, though. This one is laser cut, yeah. But if you wanted to do a laser cut image, a piece of artwork into that. Oh yeah, yeah. We we engrave the whole thing ourselves. Yeah. And, yeah, people can choose from the custom or the artist series that I curate, or send in their own custom designs. So. Well, we're done with our lecture element, so all questions and feedback, comments. I've got to say, as an extremely happy customer, that I, I wouldn't have been a customer if you guys were made in China. It was you know, what I was looking for. It was someone made in the United States, and mm -hmm. imagine how ecstatic I was. I found something actually made here in Portland. Mm -hmm. Not only that, it was just so elegant and beautiful. But I think that a huge benefit of the local manufacturer is that there are a lot of folks that are attracted to something made in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, and that helps us exist. Like uh, I don't think we could have existed 10 years ago. First of all, the internet. And then a lot of people are willing to give uh, small, small companies a chance. And then people are willing to support uh, locally made. There's a whole movement. It's money so. towards a good cause. I, right. I wasn't even going to get a case. And I only mm -hmm. the case that I would consider getting would be one that would Money away from <laughs> overseas or anything. Yeah. So. It's definitely um, without our consumers, we, we wouldn't even exist. And the, the ch it's changing. Things are changing how people are thinking about what they buy. They actually care about who makes it, what's in it, et cetera, et cetera. Where are most of your consumers that are here? Are they nationwide or international? Um, uh, about half are international, actually. So, yeah. Yeah, a lot, a lot of New York. Um, LA, San Francisco. So. Yeah. Are you guys looking to branch out and do other things than the Apple products? Like, I don't know what that might be. I, I wear, I mean, just like anything else. I mean, you're doing some beautiful work, so 
seems to take that idea to a lot of other things also. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's kind of, that's that's a, brings up an interesting a, point. Can't uh, talk about that right now. <laughs> well, <laughs> we actually have too many ideas. Uh, as a, you know, we have 15 people in our company, and we're all creative. We only hire creative people. We discriminate. <laughs> <laughs> so that means we have a million ideas of things we want to do. Um, we actually have some finished products that we're not able to launch. Yeah, you can't release everything. We're, we're yeah. just um, really focusing in on the products we have on the table right now. But um, yeah, this, this project of, of just you know selling art for art's sake instead of something that's tied to another product, um, I'm really excited about the prospects of, of this project. Well, you saw that the, the longer, really intricate piece mm -hmm. that's like part of that series. It will be soon, yeah. Yeah, so that's beautiful. But yeah, I, didn't, I didn't see anything. This, it, it looked like art, and it's not really practical. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. beautiful. Right. <laughs> so that, that brings up, you know, that's a big disadvantage is, is we're limited on what we can do. It's huge. Because uh, we're small, you know, and we have these core values. And can't do it, can't do everything. We don't have the capacity. So how yeah, is not limited? What big company could launch any random product? <laughs> yeah. Right? Our, yeah, our production is limited. Yeah. 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 I think it's I think it's Can you talk a little bit about how you find these creative people? What's your hiring process like? Is it is it <laughs> really uh, your manufacturing process? Um we've been lucky to find um, New talent through friends and just um, right. friends of friends, and um, we we haven't gone to Craigslist um, yet, <laughs> which <laughs> Thank I'm really thankful. Um, but uh, University of Oregon, we have interns. <laughs> right. Yeah, the product design program at U of O. Pipeline of yeah. talent. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks a lot, guys. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs>
Thank <laughs> you. 